So good morning, everyone. I'm very honored. And actually, I'm also delighted and personally so happy to be here today with one of the most important contemporary writer, Lauren Goff. Welcome, Lauren, with us. Ciao. Hi, Chiara. So nice to see you. Hi, so nice for me too. And uh, Lauren's Graf, Lauren Groff's la latest novel, Matrix, is shortlisted for the Premio von Rezzori. Uh, so I'm glad to be here with Lauren to dig a little bit more into this masterpiece of hers, uh, Matrix, which is published in Italy by Bonpiani with uh, the wonderful, miraculously translation of Tommaso Pincio. I wish to remember Tommaso, who is also a writer and translates beautifully all of your uh, works. So the first thing I need to ask you, Lauren, I'm, I'm sure you have been asked it quite a few times already, but it's really something I'm curious about because when we first heard that you were writing a new novel, of course, we were all so excited. And then uh, we found out that you were writing a novel set in the 12th century in a nunnery and that uh, the main character was Marie de France, the first French poet. Though it's quite a peculiar subject, let's say that. And so <laughs> I, I was, we were all wondering why did she pick such a very... Uh, a difficult subject so far from the sensitivity of the contemporary world. Then, of course, when we read the book, we were all immersed into this beautiful world that you created for us. And yet the question remains, what brought you there? What brought you to Marie de France, to England, to 12th century, to this nunnery? Sometimes when you think about your impetus to write anything, it's just a, a snarly knot of rope ends. Um, so I have to say, I, plucking them out is a little bit difficult. Uh, I have always been in love with Marie de France, the first published female poet in the French language. Ever since I studied her at university, I did some translations of her lay uh, from medieval ancien français to English. Uh, and... I was just astonished by how vibrant and contemporary her voice seemed to me at the time. But also, uh, I do believe it is the artist's imperative to interact with the contemporary. And I say this knowing that I, you know, the book at hand is set in the 12th century. But I wanted to engage with a lot of the issues of the day um, without necessarily having to engage with things like cell phones or Donald Trump or um, hurricanes right, or pandemics, things that uh, were so, I think, in some ways distracting me from the, the really meaty and urgent things that I deeply wanted to talk about. right? I wanted to talk about God and our relationship to God and the way that the Catholic Church, especially the early one, um, is a cage, for, particularly for women. I wanted to, to think through how the early church brought us to where we are today in terms of uh, the Anthropocene and climate change, right? I wanted to think about um, female power, uh, particularly after the 2016 U.S. Um, election with uh, a very strong, powerful, intelligent, um, qualified woman losing to a man who is so deeply unqualified in every single way. So there was... We, uh, there need were a popular vote. we need a popular vote. As well. Yes, right. <laughs> She won the popular vote, but of course, we don't really live in a true democracy, so she didn't actually win. So uh, it, was, it was very frustrating. So I, I thought, oh, how beautiful I could actually write about this person that I'm deeply in love with uh, and have been for a long time, but also think through these ideas in a microcosm, right? Create a little petri dish of um, utopia and see, see how all of these things uh, play out. 
over the course of the, of the novel. So, and I also, to be perfectly honest, and you know this about me because we've loved each other for a long time, but um, I don't ever want to write a book that feels easy or um, or not an, a tremendous risk. Uh, so, and this was very risky. I knew nothing really about the 12th century and it was joyous that way. And we thank you for having done this very difficult task and take us and took us there. And actually, you said something that is very interesting, the contemporary and the ancient world, or, or at the medieval world that you that you uh, depicted. So you then chose a title, which is Matrix. And we know Matrix is a Latin word that means uh, womb, the maternal womb, but also a motherboard. Uh, for us of our age, it is also a word that is indelibly connected to the film um, made by the now sisters Wachowski and that depicts uh, also another word, uh, a dystopian word. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was curious what kind of matrix had you in mind when you chose this title because I am sure it's impossible you, you never thought about matrix the film when you, when you <laughs> picked the word. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No. And I, I actually had to fight very hard to, to keep my title. It's, it, it was always Matrix to me. Um, so the word just means so many beautiful things. And uh, I think a lot of writers go into writing because they're profoundly in love with words, right? These little signifiers sort of, um, I think the ancient Greeks used to call them uh, fleeting gods, right? That, 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 that jump through the air, you catch them and then they go on, you know? Um, but the word matrix is so extraordinary, right? Because it does, as you say, mean womb, mother. It also... Um, manifests itself in so many different disciplines and fields, right? It is the substrate in which gemstones are found, right? That's the matrix, right? It's the organizational um, uh, grid work for a, a great deal of things. Um, I even, last time I was in Italy, I uh, went to go see a mask maker and he had this this wooden form that he was sort of spreading this leather mask over top. And I understand enough Italian to sort of understand what he was saying as he was explaining his whole process. And then when he finished and took off the, the leather and showed us the, the form, he called it the matrix. Right? It was his, his matrix of that. So I thought that, you know, as an idea, as the, the, the original from which other things are copied and made, uh, that's one of the ideas that I was trying to get at over the course of this book, right? That there, there could have been another way for the Catholic Church to be. And in fact, if you look at the whole history of the Catholic Church, um, there are these eruptions of feminine power that are subsequently squashed <laughs> throughout you know, the, the um, centuries and the millennia. Uh, so one of the ideas was, what if there were a model um, uh, of an alternate Catholic church that could have been made? And of course, we, we all know what happens. Yes. And you were raised in a religious family, so if I remind well. Um, but you always dwell into this kind of uh, uh, alternative communes, ways of living in some of your novels. One of my favorite of all your works is Arcadia. I um, really uh, have a bo special bond with that novel of yours. And that is the story of a hippie commune that tries to live with a different set of rules. And now in Matrix, it's... Uh, an abbe, it's uh, nuns trying to live in, with their own sets of rules, even if the rules are not really set by them, and if they did not, m in many occasions, choose to be there. They were sent there, they were forced to stay there. Yet it's a community which lives in a very different way than the ordinary world does. So it seems to me that you are always fascinated by exploring these alternative ways of life, utopian, religious. Mm -hmm. Is it so? Does it come from something inside of us or from something outside of you? 
Well, I think the novel as a form is obsessed with the idea of the individual within community. I mean, I, you can find and think of many examples um, otherwise, but I think that that is one of the, the things that the novel does so well. It, it shows sort of an individual coming up against the boundaries and the borders of community, pushing against that and seeing if the community pushes back. Uh, that, of course, is my... Um, central concern in all of my books. Every book I've ever written has been really vibrating with this this like tension about individualism versus community. I think partially it feels so urgent to me because I do live in the United States of America in which um, there is almost a cult of individualism to the extent that uh, you know, we have more guns now in the U.S. than we have citizens, right? It's, um, it, 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 I feel as though uh, it has tipped so far the wrong way that uh, if we come back to the idea of community, it, it, it can't come too soon, right? So I think um, just having the, the everyday tensions of living in this place where you see radical individualism um, manifesting politically, manifesting in everyday life, uh, it, it feels urgent to me. But also, yes, I, I grew up in a very tiny town, uh, a village actually, and the beautiful thing about living in a village is that you do feel seen, you feel supported, you feel known by everyone around you. It's a gilded cage, right? Because the people around you also know you too well, right? They, I think it's very hard to become someone different within that, uh, the, the set of expectations, right? Uh, and uh, if you misbehave, you hold that um, scarlet letter, you know, for the rest of your life. So uh, I think the tensions of having been raised in a small town where everybody knows everybody else's business, um, and then going out into the world and, and not only longing for that early developmental uh, stage, but also resisting it very deeply, these things carried along into the rest of my life. But again, I mean, one could make the argument that any novel uh, is concerned with the exact same things. It's just that... Um, some of them hide behind perhaps different or more flashy uh, cover stories. Yes, mm -hmm. I think so too. And that applies to you for sure. As a reader, <laughs> I must say that I always find you, your voice, and also your obsessions, uh, even if you tackle different uh, situations, different characters, different words. I always find sort of this obsession. And uh, uh, Tommaso Pincho was was uh, talking about you uh, at, the, uh, at, at a venue recently and he said you are such a way of writing that is feminine and so strong and fierce and sometimes angry. <laughs> so do you think anger is also a part of your obsessions? Because I always find in your novels some part of anger in the voice, which is very important, especially in the women character, in my opinion, to be expressed. Uh, oh, yes. First of all, can I just say I love Tommaso Pincho so much. I love <laughs> so much. You know, translators are so special. They're such special, incredible people, and they don't get enough love. Um, but I'm, he is just the greatest human. Um, let me, you know, I do think about anger a great deal. I think um, all of the negative emotions, the unfeminine un emotions, the ones that are, um, you get a little yelled at if you express them. Those are really interesting emotions, uh, novelistically, right? Um, to, to think about through fiction. And I personally am probably pretty angry myself, but I do think of anger as not a destructive emotion. I think of self-hatred as deeply destructive, and I think that is anger turned inward. But anger, if one knows how to channel it, if you can um, use it like a laser beam, as opposed to just sort of letting it out into the world uh, like a thunderstorm, but using it really um, as a tool, it 
it can do so many wonderful things, right? It can show you the limits of your understanding and um, your ability to deal with other human beings. It can show you where you need to grow, uh, the directions in which society is failing you. I think anger is a, actually a very beautiful, very natural, very human emotion. And women are not necessarily, at least in our culture, American, European culture, women are not allowed the space to have public anger. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that is why I think it's so important that you can really uh, put anger in your novels into the into a, a female character and that character is amazing and powerful and uh, we need to be able as women to uh, get angry <laughs> in public mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. and another thing that i find always in your books in your novels is the body as a very important character the body is always uh, put front stage in so many of your short stories and your novels. And here in Matrix is particularly uh, interesting because normally nuns are treated as uh, spiritual creatures that the body is not supposed to be uh, talked about. Well, here in your book, the nuns, the body of these women is a real thing. So the body is hungry, needs to be fed, and the body is dirty and needs to take a bath at least once a month. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it was not very popular to, to bath at that time, as you, as, you write, as you explained to us. And then also the body has uh, uh, pimples and maladies and menstruations and... Uh, menopause and uh, humps and hunches and tensions and in the end also uh, pregnancy, unwanted one and uh, deliveries are depicted always in a very uh, clear, clear way. Uh, so the body, is it important to you as a writer, I suppose? Tell us oh, if it's so or not, or it's not. <laughs> no, it's, um, you, you're right. I mean, it's immensely important to me. I, we are, we are all animals, right? Whether or not we want to believe ourselves to be in the same world as squirrels and rats and foxes, and, you know, the animals that I've seen personally walk across this lawn behind me. Um, I think that. Mo we only understand things through the body first before the intellect is able to process them, right? We, we feel our emotions uh, through adrenaline or our increased heartbeat or, um, you know, the capillary action in our faces, blushing, right? All of these things are, are the locus of the intellect. The intellect only comes out of these things. And my, my idea, too, I believe this very firmly, is that wherever God is, God is also in the body, right? So um, the Quakers have this beautiful idea that everyone holds the spark of God within them. And I would say that's absolutely the case, right? Whether or not you believe uh, in any sort of religious dogma, I do think God is, is in the human body and probably in the bodies of the animals as well. So I, um, I am so obsessed with the physicality of my characters, right? I want them to feel like actual human beings. And I also, one of the things when you sit down to write a, a historical novel, even if it's, you know, it's very, Matrix is deeply researched, but I didn't want it to feel deeply researched. I wanted to sort of flow uh, like a river and sort of and, and make you come in. And I didn't want to just throw a bunch of facts at you. But how does one as a 21st century person interact with the past? Right? How does one understand the past in a way that makes it come alive and sort of burst into a new form of understanding? The only way I know how to do this is to take what I have researched and 
Um, and then think about it through my actual body. So I don't know what it is like to be a 12th century nun, but I do know what it's like to press my face, my hot feverish face on cold stone, right? I know how that feels. I know how it feels to hold a bowl full of warm gruel. Even if I don't necessarily know how it feels to have um, a, a priest, you know, yelling at me for, for doing something wrong. So I can find common cause with the, the humans of the past through this shared thing that we have, which is this intricate machine of the human body. And I think that that's very beautiful. I mean, we can all sort of come back in and open up the senses and figure out things that we can we can share with the past and write from that experience, even if we don't have direct experience being in the time and place that you're writing about. Yes, and then it brings so much life to the characters too. I feel them so near to my body experience. You describe body experience so well. It's amazing. That's one of the main yeah. gifts you have. Uh, so, we have time for a couple of final questions, but there is one I want to, to ask you, and especially because it's not really a question, but um, something I want to tell. So, to tell you, so the, you famously answered to an interviewer that were, was asking you, how do you juggle between your family life and children and your work? And your family and said, I respectfully uh, decline to answer this specific question until it is asked to a man. So I want to express my gratitude uh, and thank you for having said that, because that is a question that was asked to so many women in the past and still in the present. And also, this shows a part of you which is a very militant one as a feminist and uh, uh, to the point where many critics found uh, Matrix to be a feminist novel because all the characters are women and powerful women and uh, the rules are set by women yet at the beginning of the very early in the novel all the men are banned, are banned from the nunnery. And so it's sort of isolating community. So I was wondering if you had thought about this. Is it really an equal word if we take men out of the equation? And I mean feminist men, of course, in the today's world. Yeah. Um, so my definition of feminist is really just uh, someone who believes men and women and people of all genders are inherently equal and that society is not set up to treat m people equally, right? I mean, that's really just and recognizing that the way that we have set up civilization, someone's going to be a loser. Um, so am I, am I a feminist? Yes. I mean, if that's the definition, the alternative to feminist is misogynist, and I'm not that. Um, at the same time, uh, it's interesting that people call it a feminist novel because there are no men at all actually in the book. Um, not even the animals are male, right? Not even, like, there are, there are only I female animals. I noticed that, that the animals are not men. Yeah. You're telling me, yes. Yeah, it's a joy. Um, so one of the things uh, about this is that I, I didn't want to write an explicitly feminist book because a world in which there are not even men, it's, it's not necessarily feminist, right? Because it's not pushing against anything but its own internal logic and its own internal rhyme. Um, so, and the other thing too I wanted to do was sort of invert the way that uh, the vast majority of literature through time has been written with men at the center and then women sort of fleeting, flitting shadows along the wall, right? I mean, it, once in a while a woman will come to, to focus in the center and then fade back out again. So I wanted to do the same thing with this book. I wanted the presence of men to be palpable, but also that they're vague. Even Jesus is not really described as a man. He's just a, a series of body parts on the wall. 
Um, which was just, you know, it was, it was an experiment to see if people would notice. And for the first probably two months of this book's life, most, most people did not actually notice. Um, is a world without men a feminist world? Uh, absolutely not, right? Because, you know, I have two sons. I have two boys. Um, I have a husband, right? I would never want a world in which there are no boys or men. But fiction is this beautiful microcosm, as I said earlier, and you can do whatever you want to in fiction as long as the rules are very clear. And so um, in regards to a conversation that I was trying to have within the novel about the idea of female power, avoiding the male gaze entirely by not having any men at all became a really interesting thing for me. One of the, the strong impulses to write this book was I was on a transatlantic flight and I was watching this 1939 George Cukor movie called The Women and it's an amazing film it's really really well done the um the writing is just so sharp so good the only characters are women there are no men at all but because it was um, written in 1939 this film has, as conversation, the only conversations that are sort of shared between all the women are about men. They almost never talk about anything but the men. And that frustrated me because there is, I don't know if you've heard about it, but um, Alison Bechdel, she is this incredible graphic novelist. She has this test for whether or not a, a narrative is a, is a feminist narrative and one of the things is, if there are two women uh, in this narrative, if, if they can talk about something other than men. And so, believe it or not, this 1939 George Cukor film called The Women, with only women in it, was not a feminist text because they only talk about men. And so there was a part of me that sort of wrote Matrix this way in reaction to that, that idea, that film. Yes, and uh, to add something to that, you uh, gave an interview to the New York Times when Fates and Furies was out, I think, and uh, they asked you what are the most important writers in the contemporary literature world today, and you only mentioned uh, women writers, and that became the news. Uh, <laughs> that became the news. Oh, Lauren Graf is only quoting women's writers as the best contemporary writers do to read and that became such a, a big thing and so at that moment we all thought there is a long way to go <laughs> well you know I, I i did it with some glee in my heart knowing that that was what was going to be the narrative right and, and know. knowing that men were going to yell at me for not including men of course i read men you can't be alive in the 21st century and not read yes, men of course, right? like, <laughs> You will be I, in a it's so crazy, of course. Um, but I wanted to make a point, uh, and the point was made, uh, but it got lost in this in the uproar, um, the wrong kind of uproar, which sometimes happens when you try to make public points in the world. Yeah, exactly. And talking about reading, and to end on a lighter note, uh, so Lauren, you said that the work of the writer is eighty percent reading. Mm -hmm. So, are you serious, Lauren? I mean, <laughs> writing is just such an exhausting work for every writer, and uh, it comes with anxiety <clears throat> and uh, so many emotions, and reading is uh, sometimes a guilty pleasure because it's so uh, nice to read. <laughs> so, so <laughs> are you sure <laughs> that yes. the work of the writer is 80% reading? Tell us yes. why. I'm deeply sure. In fact, I'd probably today put it at 90%. So it's not that I, I, I work every day. I sit down to write my, my books every single day. Um, and I try to come at it with pleasure, right? Because I think that when we, when it is painful, it's painful not necessarily because we are deeply into the work itself. We can't quite say what we want to say. It's, it's, it's difficult because of the expectations for the product, right? But the product 
is not writing. The process is the writing, right? The process of, of engaging, thinking, um, failing, coming to terms with what we want to do, not being able to do it quite yet, sort of slowly moving ourselves in the direction of the work that we want to do. That is so important. That is writing, right? The product that's, you know, if we're lucky, it comes out into the world. Real writing is the engagement, the wrestling. And part of that process of wrestling after one has exhausted oneself, um, trying and failing, trying and failing, is then going to the books that give your book life, right? Going to the poems that say something that you want to reflect back into the, into the world. Going back to the things that made you want to be a writer to begin with, right? All of these things, because what you're doing when you write is having a conversation with the past, with, with other writers, with other people in the grand river of literature. You're just swimming with them, right? And, and so, this sort of goes back to my idea about um, community individualism. If we think of ourselves as individual writers, we're going to struggle. We're going to feel sick to our stomachs. We're going to have a hard time writing. If we think of ourselves as one voice in a very loud conversation that's taken place over millennia, then it's going to be like fun, right? Because we're just one among many, and we're just trying to add our voice to the, the larger chorus. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> this has been such a nice conversation with you. <clears throat> and of course, you are also shortlisted with many other amazing writers. So I'm happy uh, and uh, I wish you all the best luck for the Premio von Rezzori for Matrix and we are waiting for your next work impatiently. Thank you all and... Well Grazie mille. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Chiara. Bye. Thank you so much.